Often it's useful to think in terms of this human experience as an educational opportunity. Uh, very often we think of school where we have uh, first grade and we just move from one level to the next to the next. I think this whole experience of incarnation is really that, that at various levels we get exposed to different, different ways of utilizing the consciousness uh, that's a part of us. And so as we develop at one level, we find that we become more proficient and we advance. So we move to other classes. Uh, perhaps in a given life, we don't perhaps use it that well. So we remain where we are. But there's this possibility to progress. Obviously, the sort of diversity of ways in which consciousness can express are almost infinite. And so no one lifetime provides the opportunity for that fullness of experience. And so what tends to happen is that we are born in various cultures, in various bodies, throughout vast periods of time. Uh, and we find ourselves being called upon to express this consciousness through this different, uh, you could say, lens, this different uh, set of limitations. And as we're able to master those particular limitations, we become more proficient, our capacity increases. And so this is the process of birth and rebirth, that it's something that ultimately we grow, ultimately we learn, and eventually we, keeping with this analogy, we can graduate from the school of just merely human experience. One of the expressions that's been said is that to the person who dies before they die, which is to say who consciously embraces what death might mean before the actual physical event takes place, that when they die, they do not die, which is kind of a convoluted way of saying that as we become conscious, and as we recognize that this is in fact one of the processes of life, it also keys in us an awareness that death, the opposite of death is not life. The opposite of death is birth. Life is a continuous process. And in becoming conscious, we become aware that we are actually connected with this ongoing life that has no ending. Let me just highlight a couple key points to keep in mind having to do with death itself. Uh, and remember, this whole process of reincarnation, uh, death and reincarnation, is just all part of the drama of the unfolding evolution of the soul's consciousness. And so many incarnations are required for the soul to reach that perfected state. When that cord is severed, that the life thread and the consciousness thread are, are, are abstracted, uh, it's very interesting because life is pulled out of the physical body and you still have an etheric body. The etheric body is the, remember, that's the energy system underlying the physical. That instrument, in most cases, the substance of the etheric body fairly quickly is released and starts to move back to the re reservoir of etheric substance. In the esoteric literature, that's called the process of restitution. Restitution. Uh, there are cases and, uh, that have to do with that not dissolving as quickly as it should. And in many cases, what people call ghosts are actually not souls that they're seeing, but actually the shells of etheric forms that are still lingering and have not dissolved. So there's a big misunderstanding about what is a ghost uh, in the mainstream as opposed to how it is viewed esoterically. It's the etheric shell that hasn't been dissolved. 
But after, after, assuming it is dissolved, and so we're not earthbound in that sense, then what's so interesting and overlooked by the masses of people is that, you know, it is said that after a person dies, always there's a second death that follows it, the second death. Now, what's the second death? Well, think about it. When a person dies, we often think, okay, their soul is now free and they're back in heaven. But wait a minute. Remember that the personality, the lower self, is composed of three structures, not just the one. There's also an emotional body and a mental body. Well, what about those instruments? Okay, they're free from the physical, but what about the other? And indeed, that is what has to, that correlates to the second death, because those instruments have to be let go as well. In a technical sense, they're sequentially let go of, but in a broader sense, the speed at which the, the soul is able to disengage from those instruments will vary according to how far you are on the path. For, uh, it, it can take, for some people, it can take just a few hours or a few days to let go of the, to, uh, that instrument in the second death. For other, but, but for other people, it can be longer. It can be months. It can be even many years before the second death occurs. And the speed at which that happens has much to do with the degree to which that soul has developed its capacity to work with a personality but not identify with it. The more disidentified we are in our day-to-day -day life with our emotions, but not with no repression of emotion, but the more disidentified we are with our emotional body, the further you are on the path and the easier that second death will come. So there's a whole science of understanding that process, but that's how it's viewed. When the second death has accomplished itself, then you're, you're moving into the causal body and, the, and there's a process just before that that's called devachan. We talked about the uh, various fields of, uh, or planes of being, the mental plane being one of those. When we talk about what's often described as the heaven life in many sorts of uh, religious traditions. This life that is often described is really what, there's a Sanskrit word that is devachan, which really is a uh, description of this sort of heaven life, which is the experience of those people in the afterlife state. And it's really at the level of the higher mental plane. And so what it is, is during the course of our lifetimes, each one of us in a normal life has certain aspirations, certain very high emotions, high thoughts, often that don't get much avenue for expression. But each one of these has a certain power to it, a certain vibratory power. What it said happens in this devachanic state is that all of these sort of uh, highest impulses that have taken place in us there's a, they have a residual sort of energy about them. And that when the personality, the body, the emotions, the lower mind drop away, that this residual energy remains. And that it's something that we experience in this realm described as devachan. So whatever our highest aspirations might have been, we find ourselves surrounded by that. And this is really what's described often as the heaven world. So there's this whole process by which lessons learned in the life are translated into wisdom that becomes stored faculty in the causal body. And that period is called devachan. And it's, it's said to be a blissful period of time uh, that that integration and, and process is occurring. And when devachan is completed, that's when the soul begins to downward gaze again and begins to contemplate its next evolutionary step.
the opportunities of death are largely the opportunities of assimilating that which has been experienced during physical plane incarnation. We are released from the physical body and can spend a relatively short time as a consciousness within our bioelectric field, which then disintegrates. Some say in three days, some say longer. If you stay too long, you can become a bit of a haunting ghost and hang around uh, where you're not really needed. But some people's attraction to the dense physical plane is so great or their need to right a wrong, or as in the case of uh, the ghost of uh, Hamlet's father to correct a murder and so forth, there can be kinds of haunting phenomena where people still occupy that etheric field. But generally they go on into the wilderness. 40 days wandering in the wilderness. It is a, an allegory for life upon the astral plane. Uh, we work out many desires uh, that we have had. We experience them, but generally they are unreal. Uh, there are certain summer lands and relative heavens, relative places of harmony during our sojourn on the astral plane. And some people rise no higher than that before they return to their soul body. But according to the nature of our desire, so will be the stratum that we focus upon in the astral plane for X number of years after death. Now, the Tibetan warned us against being dogmatic about X, Y, Z number of years spent in the internal worlds. Some people intent on service on the outer planes can move swiftly, fleetly through the astral plane and the mental plane, give up their heaven experience on the mental plane, return to the um, soul body and return quickly. Others don't even have to go back to the soul body. They preserve their astrality and their mentality intact and from that point are able to seek incarnation within just a few years. Those who are fairly developed in their life of service may do that. And if they develop a degree of continuity of consciousness while they are in their normal personality mind so they can slip in and out of the body and be aware of what's going on in the astral plane and so forth, they can possibly choose this method of rapid return. But let's just say we have a lot of desires which just are not met here on this plane. And the astral plane gives us an opportunity to at least attempt to fulfill some of these desires. Some of them are not capable of being fulfilled. Some of them are evil. With the lower levels of the astral plane, the sixth and seventh subplanes, we are to have nothing to do. And none of that type of matter is supposed to enter our emotional body. Those are the, as the Tibetan describes it, the hell worlds of the average believer. And we are supposed to be working on the upper five subplanes where we have such things as uh, idealism, uh, imagination, astral clairvoyance, astral clair uh, psychometry, astral clairaudience, all of these inner faculties are fully developed and experienced on those levels. But Master Moria advises us, if we are disciples, move swiftly, fleetly through the desert. Fleetly through these astral experiences. Do not wander for 40 years in the wilderness and make your way into the next level, which is the lower mental plane, where our higher faculties are developed through intense concentration without interference. It's still a semi-illusory world, but we are able to build up the faculties that we have not fully expressed on, uh, in the outer plane. We work in what's called Devachan. Devachan is another name for heaven, and it's found on the fourth level of the mental plane. And for those who earn it, much progress can be made there. 
so that we fulfill our higher mental aspirations and become uh, incarnated in a way that is more equipped during the next life. Now some sacrificial serving souls, if they've earned the right to do so, forego their devachan. Master D.K. talks about this. It's just not, you know, you can't just do it because you want to. But if you're at a certain stage of development, you can re-enter rapidly, pick up the thread of service, and preserve consciousness of your previous incarnation in a form that is useful enough to utilize. Because your astral body does not have to be reformulated. Your mental body does not have to be reformulated. If you go all the way back to the soul center, then you follow the normal method of appropriation. The notes has to sound. We gather new material. And the repository of our experience is in the uh, mental unit, in the astral permanent atom, in the physical permanent atom. These are technicalities, but suffice it to say, we don't have a full-blown astral body, a full-blown mental body containing all the things we had before. But we can have that if we are intent on service, if we've developed some continuity of consciousness and are ready to return rapidly, foregoing the bliss of the Devachan world. Most people, however, even highly developed people, will shed their desire body, dying to it, just the way we died to our etheric and physical body, and go into the mental body, experience their Devachan world, build up faculty for their next incarnation, undergo the dissipation of the uh, mental lower mental form, and enter the egoic lotus, enter the causal body, enter the soul body, from which a new incarnation is planned, reformulated, its rays and astrology thought through, and the process of appropriation begins all over again. As long as we are not an initiate of the fourth degree, the causal body is home. The egoic body is home. We're not going to break out of that. But we are in the presence of the great solar angel as the angel of the presence. And there's so much of bliss and understanding and realization of the past several lives and several lives to come that we plan properly and reappropriate. Uh, to summarize what we've been talking about here, just realize that this journey of human life is a long journey. It takes hundreds, actually thousands of incarnations to complete this journey. And that at first it's all about slowly building personality, building the ego, and eventually then beginning to integrate that personality, that, in, in, that ego, into a, an effective uh, force in the outer world. That then leads to the, rep re uh, the readiness of the soul itself to begin to inspire and awaken that personality and slowly over time begin to convince that personality to yield its, its authority and allow it to be the outer agent on behalf of the soul's intention. And that process leads to measures of soul infusion where the soul slowly starts to infuse into the personality and the degree of infusion is just having to do with talking about how much of the personality has let go and how much has not yet let go. And there's a whole science in this philosophy having to do with the, those incremental levels of infusion, and we call that the science of initiation, that there is a whole initiation process that takes place. 
uh, several initiations lead from the awakening to the place where we would call full enlightenment and to become a master. Uh, all of this is a process of movement from the fourth kingdom of nature to the fifth kingdom of nature and entrance into a whole other regime. And from that point forward, the necessity of incarnation and reincarnation goes away. And for most souls, once that successful process has occurred, um, reincarnation doesn't happen again unless by choice. Prior to that, up to that point, you have no choice. Reincarnation is an inescapable uh, reality. Many people believe, uh, I've, uh, over the years I've met many people who would say to me, I'm convinced this is my last incarnation. And yet if, if they really understood what that means and the implications of that, it's, it's staggering. What often happens is people, they look at their lives and they say, this life has been so difficult. I've learned so many lessons. I've paid my dues. Surely this is the last incarnation. I'm not coming back. That's really the personality speaking of its, its uh, fatigue over the challenges of the incarnation. But it really has, it is not a, a true statement to say that this is my last incarnation. Uh, that doesn't occur until what we call the fourth initiation so that's perspective to keep in mind as you think about this long journey. The good news is that the further you go, the more joy there is as well.